This morning, I'd like to talk with you about the doctrine of eyes. In the fourth way, there's obviously doctrine. And the doctrine of eyes is a basic doctrine of the fourth way that everybody who finds out about the fourth way, anybody who gets involved with the system, has to know pretty much right from the very beginning is this doctrine of eyes. So I thought we'd go over this. How many eyes have we got in us? Ospensky once asked. And he went on to say, have we 20 or 30? And then he said, we have hundreds of thousands. The concept, hundreds of thousands, is difficult for us because, essentially, we consider ourselves to be one eye. I am me. It's me. But do you have different facets? Yes, but they're different facets of me. I have different moods. I have different thoughts. I have different feelings. But I'm still me. I'm still really one big eye who's really always the same, and you can look at it from different sides. Isn't that pretty much how we view ourselves? And this is the problem. The doctrine of eyes in the fourth way says this is not so. This is not the way it is at all. That this is imaginary eye. Because of the action of buffers, we don't see these different eyes as distinct. We simply see them as part of the whole. We retain our belief that we have only one eye that always acts and feels basically in the same way. When this happens, it does this. When that happens, it does that. If somebody is unkind to it, they get angry, but it's patient and tolerant and forgiving. That's who we are, right? Most of us don't look at ourselves like, well, who I am all the time, most of the time is I'm just a miserable curmudgeon who jumps down everybody's throat at every chance I get. I'm sorry, even if you say you think that about yourself, you're a liar. Because that's not how you really think about yourself. You may have a blip on the radar screen that comes up once in a while and you think, oh, I'm a terrible person. But you don't really believe it. Because when somebody treats you like a terrible person, you get offended. And that's usually a pretty sure indication that you don't really believe that about yourself. So this is imaginary eye that prevents us from changing. When asked if these eyes weren't imaginary, he said, eyes were real beings in us, real persons. Ospensky said this. So somebody asked him, well, aren't, aren't these eyes just imaginary? He said, oh, no. Oh, no, the eyes are not imaginary. You're imaginary. The eyes are real. The eyes are real persons really living inside of you. We have to get this idea out of our heads that an eye has to have a body. They're not little people living inside of you. They are little identities living inside of you, little egos living inside of you. Each I is a small living person in oneself. Each I has a thinking, emotional, and moving part. It has a center of gravity, which may be more in one part than another part, just like everyone you know has a center of gravity that may be more in one part than another part. Some people, their center of gravity is in their thinking part. Some people, their center of gravity is in their feeling part. Some people, their center of gravity is in their moving part how that would relate in, say, a school setting is there are some students that a teacher would deal with intellectually, some students a teacher would deal with emotionally, and some students a teacher would deal with in a moving way, in a tactile way, by touching or by getting the person up and moving, and that would be their best way of learning. Another person, their best way of learning would be intellectual. Another person, their best way of learning would be something emotional. It would impress them emotionally. And a good teacher would know that and then teach their students accordingly. Makes sense, doesn't it? You've taught your children, so you know that each of them are different. And you may have the same curriculum for them, but you have to approach each one in a different way if you're going to be an effective teacher and if they're going to be effective students. Each I is a distinct being that takes charge of us, speaking through our mouth, calling itself I, at different times. So here we have this person I call James Parkinson, who thinks that he is one person. And this doctor of advice says, no, he's not one person. He's really a body and a psychology containing hundreds of thousands of little people, little eyes in there. And whichever one happens to be in control at the moment is the one that's using the mouth and saying whatever it's saying or feeling whatever it's feeling or thinking whatever it's thinking. Some of these eyes are very harmful. Some are indifferent and some are useful. How do you know which are which? We don't know. And the reason we don't know is because we don't even know they exist. All you have right now is me saying they exist. Until you have been able to verify this for yourself, all you have is the belief, the doctrine. And we know what good doctrine is. It's like, no good at all. 
if that's all you have and if you never do anything with it. Doctrine is something that needs to be applied and verified. If you don't apply it and verify it, then it becomes poisonous and eventually it will poison your whole body. It will make you sick. All moods, feelings, actions and words come from different eyes in yourself. We have no individuality. We don't like that. People don't like to be told they have no individuality. It's like, yes I do. I'm unique. There's no one else like me in the whole world. God made me and God doesn't make junk. I'm a king's kid. I am like a snowflake. Yes, and I am like a fingerprint. I'm individual. There's nothing else in the universe like me. Yep, you're special just like everybody else. So that's a big one to get past because we don't like getting past having no individuality. Real eye, big eye that controls all other eyes, arranging them in their right order, doesn't really exist in us at this point. How can we prove that? No, mostly you can't keep your word. Mostly you can't do anything. You say you're going to do something, like, well, I'm never going to speak to that person again. Well, I'm never going to fall into that trap again. Well, I'm never going to do this. Well, I'll never forgive that person. Can you really do that? And a lot of people think they can. And you can think you can, you can believe you can. And you'll believe it until you see that you don't. And the only way you'll ever see that you don't is if you begin to question whether or not what you believe is true, whether or not what you believe is real. And you'll never question that unless there's something inside of you that requires a little bit more from life. Something inside of you says there's got to be something more to life than just this life. There's got to be some other reason for existence than just going to work, making money, coming home and spending it. Then going to work and making money, coming home and spending it and trying to find something enjoyable about that. And it's true, the whole world's doing it. That's why entertainment is so popular. Okay, well I made the money, now what should I do? Well, you go spend it. Well, I got enough shoes, I got enough clothes, I got the car, I got the house, I got this, I got that. Now what do I do with it? Well, travel. Well, why? Once you get there, there you are. Or, well, go get entertained. Go out to eat, go to the movies, go to a show, go get entertained. Go to Las Vegas and get rid of some of your money there. Or go to Las Vegas and get rid of all of your money there. Whatever. It's easier to observe eyes acting on thoughts at first. Observe that you think in a certain way about someone. It's an eye that's thinking that you take as yourself. Think of a person, some person. Well, think of me. Here I am standing in front of you. Can you see, can you observe that you think about me in a certain way? You think about me and you'll have certain thoughts. And if you think about me often enough, you'll notice that those thoughts are repetitive. There'll be categories. He's really a great guy. He's really a jerk. There'll be categories that those thoughts will fall into. And in this moment, well, he's really a great guy today because he's really being a great guy. He told me that my hair looks nice, he likes my pants, or he told me I was doing a good job, or he smiled at me, or he patted me on the back, or he hugged me. He's a great guy. But then there was the day that he told me that I was ugly and uh, my mother dressed me funny. Boy, he was a real jerk that day. He must have got up on the wrong side of the bed. So he's really a great guy, but sometimes he gets in these moods and he's really not so great. Well, he's a great guy to me, but he treats Sybil like she's got six heads. Well, I know when I think like that, that's all that keeps me from being aware that this is a different eye, this is a different eye, this is a different eye, it's all me. Yeah, Curtis got a good point. When we think like that, when we think, well, he's this, he just got up on the wrong side of the bed, he's just in a mood, he's just in a snit, oh, he's being nice today. It keeps us from ever seeing what in us is receiving whatever stimulus we're getting from outside and how what in us is arranging it. It gives us no responsibility whatsoever for what comes into us which puts us in a very mechanical state. Yeah, we receive it as if we have one eye, but you have many. Exactly. We receive it as if we have one eye. We are one, the same, all the time, but you are not. Good point. So, we start off observing thoughts, because that's the easiest to do. When you don't see this trick that's constantly being played on you, we take the thoughts that we're having as ourselves. That's what I think. Well, I think this. Well, I think that. So when we don't see this trick that's being played on us, that we're really many different persons living in here. There are many different people living in here, little people with individual personalities, with their own thoughts, their own feelings, and their own movements. When we believe that we are one, that's a trick that's being played on us. And then we think that whatever thoughts we're hearing in our heads are our thoughts. Whatever voices we're hearing in our heads, well, that's my voice. That's what I think. Well, that's what I feel. We think I'm thinking this. This is how I think. But what we don't know is that something is thinking for you, and you're not thinking at all. We hear these thoughts, these eyes, as if we were thinking them. And the truth is, we only think we think. We're not really thinking. 
And you've been able to observe this from time to time. And I've said, okay, think about it. And you can't. The idea is just too far above you and you cannot grasp it. I can't reach it, as Joshua would say. Joshua, get that bug. I can't reach it. And what did that mean when Joshua, you remember that? Does anybody remember that? There was a bug on the floor and Connie said, Joshua was a little guy, really little guy. He could hardly talk. And Connie said, get that bug, Josh. He was afraid of the bug. He goes, ooh, and it was about a foot away from him. I can't reach it. And we thought that was really funny. And what I can't reach it meant was, I don't want to touch that bug. That bug might hurt me and I don't want to touch that bug. I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to be bitten or stung or get cooties or whatever bugs do. I don't want any part of it. I can't reach it. And he believed it. He believed he couldn't reach it. Or he believed that would work. And that's the way we are. We have all these beliefs and we buy into them. And one of the beliefs that we have bought into totally is that this imaginary I is real I. It's really me. And what we find through observation is that's not the way it is at all. But it takes a long time to observe that. And it takes an even longer time to realize it and to begin to operate from it. I think this is one of the greatest mistakes that we can make in this work. Well, I think is one of the greatest mistakes that we can make in this work. Because when we say, well, I think, I think this, what we're doing is we're identifying with the little person, the little I in there that is doing the thinking at the moment. We're identifying with that. And once we've identified with that, we have given it all of our power. It's like a king taking his ring, which has the king's seal on it, and giving it to somebody and saying, there you go. And that whoever that is goes out in any place they put that seal, that's the king's word and that's a law and that's the way it is in that land. That person is effectively the king of the land. But then they only have it for a few moments and then someone else gets the ring. And the ring is like just tossed up into a crowd and whoever grabs it is the one that gets to seal something with it and that's the law right now. This is our condition. There's a multitude within us and whoever gets the mouth has the king's seal for the moment. And whatever they get to say is law for the moment. Think about what people hear from you. They hear something from you and like, that, that's what you think. That's what they think. They think, well, that's what that person thinks. That's who that person is. Is it? Rarely, if ever. We'll say rarely, because if I say, no, it's not, it never is, then you just get argumentative about that and that doesn't help anybody. We have to practice inner separation. And it can't be done when we're taking everything that happens in the sphere of thoughts as I. You cannot practice inner separation if every single thought that comes into your head, you say, well, I think this. Because you see that you're identified with every thought that blows into your mind. I've told you before, remember, I used to say that our minds are like a playground. And, you know, recess time, the playground's full. And then recess is over, the playground is empty. So then what happens when the playground is empty? Well, trash blows through. The wind kicks up and papers blow through and cups and this and that. And if we jump on one of them and saying, oh, this is me, oh, this is me, oh, this is what I think, oh, this is what I feel. And that's the condition that we're in. When the playground is full, whichever one we're touching at the time, that's me. When the playground is empty, then it's whatever blows through. Because the playground is never really empty. Our minds are never really empty. We're aware of what's going on in them or we're not. Most of the time we're not. At any rate, we are identifying with whatever it is that's going on in there and that keeps us from ever being able to practice inner separation. Eyes transmit feeling into the sphere of emotions. Eyes transmit thoughts into the sphere of thinking. Eyes transmit feelings into the sphere of emotions. Now the problem with the feelings, why we start with thoughts, is because they're easier to catch. Feelings are not easier to catch, they're harder to catch. And the reason they're harder to catch is because feelings are injected into the emotional sphere nearly directly. There's very little thinking involved in it. It's just too fast for thoughts. Feelings are too fast for thoughts. Have you noticed that? You can feel much faster than you can think. Somebody says something, you may not even know what they said. You may not be able to hear what they said, but you have a gut reaction to it. That didn't feel good. What did you mean by that? We may not even have heard the words, but we got the feeling. That didn't feel good. The look on the person's face. They had an angry look on their face and they said something. And we got the feeling that we were in trouble. We got the feeling that they were mad at us. We got the feeling that we weren't good enough. 
We don't even know what they said, so we have no thoughts to back it up. Feelings operate quickly, and they are independent most of the time from thoughts. So that's why we start with thinking. They're direct, and they hardly touch thinking at all. Now, some of these feelings can exhaust us. Some of them can make us lose confidence in ourselves. Some of those feelings can make us depressed or low in spirit or like throwing in the towel, giving up. It's like, I've had it. I can't. I'll never get to do this. I've heard this from everybody over the past few weeks. I'm never going to make it. This stuff, it's too much. There are too many eyes in here. I can't identify them all. I can't stop them. I don't have any power to do anything about this. And those are all feelings that are being injected into the emotional sphere by eyes. So when the thoughts no longer work, what does? Well, the feelings. When an eye says to Steve, don't mess with me, I'll walk you out of here. And Steve goes, well, who are you calling you, you dummy? If you're calling me you, then you're not me. So you're already giving yourself away. So that eye disappears for a while. But then feelings don't. Then it starts to operate in feelings. And then you feel like you're never going to make it. And then you feel like you're powerless. And then you feel like there are too many up. And then you feel like you're overwhelmed. And then you feel like giving up. And then you feel depressed. And then you feel like you have no confidence in yourself because you can't do anything. And so the battle continues. Exciting, huh? Oh. The funny thing is, it's not funny, I guess, is these eyes that are acting on us are nourishing themselves at our expense. All the time that they're stealing our mouths, stealing our feelings, stealing our right to ourself, they are nourishing themselves. Let's say that there's an eye in here that, well, let's not say it. There's an eye in here that can sign checks. It goes shopping because it feels depressed. So it goes shopping and it buys all this stupid, useless stuff and it doesn't have the money for it, but it signs a check anyway. Writes the check, signs it, and signs my name to it. Then the check bounces, and the bank calls me up, but that eye's nowhere to be found when it comes to answering the phone. I have to answer the phone, which is this other eye, this responsible eye, or this eye that calls itself responsible, and it calls the other one irresponsible. It answers the phone, and it says, what do you mean? I didn't write a check like that. And they say, well, here's the check. Your check's bounced. Try all this stuff. Well, somebody must have stole my checkbook. Well, that's a forgery. But it's sure enough, it's your signature. Or your credit card. Probably easier with a credit card. People use their credit card and go, what's this for? They get the bill and go, what's this for? I don't remember this. Then they go to their husband or wife. Hey, you, what did you do? When it's actually, they just can't remember which I was using the credit card that day. Which I was on a binge that day. We do it with food. We do it with sex. We do it with clothes, we do it with stuff. I mean, people are out there doing it all the time. It's what makes this society keep going. It's what a consumer society is all about. So we've got to practice this inner separation. If we could remember ourselves always, these eyes could have no power over us. As it is, we hardly ever challenge them, so they run our emotional lives. As we are in our current state, we are not able to remember ourselves from time to time during a day, let alone all the time, all day. If you could remember yourself all day, if you could remember these eyes were vying for your mouth or control all day, then you could separate from them and say, well, no, you're not going to get your way, no. But we can't. And because we can't, we have this difficulty with this inner separation because they have power over us, because we're identified with them. One of the things about the feelings, and the thoughts are much easier to deal with, one of the things about the feelings is you can't tell when an eye has injected its feelings into your emotional sphere, unless you notice a sudden drop in your level of being, or a sudden loss of force. Suddenly you just feel, oh, I need a nap. If we're quick enough, we can catch it then. If we can catch it then, we can do something about it. But if we don't catch it then, if we're not quick enough, then we've got problems. These eyes take possession and it could take us days to get rid of them. We've got to learn to walk within ourselves very carefully. Remember I saw that movie a long time ago, Four Feathers, I think it was. And in that movie, one of the things that this Muslim guy says to this English guy is, you walk the earth too proudly. And that made a huge impression on me because I realized that we, Civilized man walks the earth too proudly. 
We do not have what we think we have. We do not possess the power that we think we possess. Every once in a while, nature comes up with a tornado, a tsunami, a hurricane, a fire, an earthquake, a disaster, and we realize we do not have the power that we think we possess. We are not the arbiters of our destiny. We are not in control of the planet. We are not who we think we are. But look what has to happen for us to get there. And then it's only temporary, because it doesn't take long for us to start thinking that we're in charge of everything again, usually when we start cleaning up. How many times have you missed it, that loss, that drop in level, or that sudden loss of force, and then it took you days to snap out of it? How many times have you missed it when you could have caught it, and you went down into the valley of the shadow of death, and it took you days to get out? Too many. Too many to count, so we'd rather forget about it. There's no use arguing with nasty eyes. One moment of being asleep in a difficult situation lets in this kind of eyes. And then we see and feel everything in their own peculiar way. Fall asleep for a moment in a difficult situation, and they'll swamp you. Then we see and feel everything in their own peculiar way. All our work in this work is separating from wrong eyes. Everything that we do is about one thing and one thing only how to separate from these wrong eyes that are ruining our lives, that are destroying our happiness, that are destroying the possibility of us waking up to this moment and to the miraculous realm in which we actually could be living if we'd get out of our imaginations about who we are, who imaginary I says we are, and who imaginary I says everyone else is, and what everything is for. It's all of our thoughts, all of our feelings, everything that comes into us is all filtered by this imaginary I so that we have no idea what's real and what's not real. All we have is what this imaginary eye says is real. And it changes its mind as many hundreds of thousands of times as there are little eyes that make it up to change their mind, to change their position, whoever's in charge at the moment. So this is essentially the doctrine of eyes that the work teaches. We start first with thoughts and later with emotions. A struggle begins in oneself between different eyes, right eyes and wrong eyes. And you all are into that struggle right now. You have studied this way long enough to be into the struggle. There are right eyes and there are wrong eyes and you know what they are. And the wrong eyes sometimes just overcome you and there's nothing you can do about it. And sometimes the right eyes went out. And at this point, it appears to be just happening from time to time. But that's how it appears, that's not the way it is. Your efforts are what are giving you the opportunity to have the right eyes win out from time to time. This work is a system of observation that comes from conscious humanity. Conscious humanity is very simply those who have gone through the battle of eyes and attained their goal. They're the people who have gone before us, who have discovered this, went through the battle of eyes, attained their goal, and came out on the other side whole, one, with real eye, a real will, a real ability to do. There are people who have done that. We look at them as great masters, spiritual leaders. Those are the people who have done it. They went through the battle that you must go through if you want to get there, where they are. That's conscious humanity. This system of observation comes from them. If we make no effort to recall better states, we're going to be dragged down. If when you experience this sudden loss, this sudden drop, if you make no effort to recall a better state, you're going to be dragged down at that point. You've got to make an effort to recall a better state. You've got to reach for something higher. You've got to reach for the rope that's hanging overhead. That's your lifeline. And that rope is this work, these ideas. If you can get hold of one of these ideas, it can be enough to keep you from being dragged down. You may not be able to haul yourself up, but at least you won't be dragged down. And that sometimes is the best that we can do. It's our choice. See, this is the way it should be. If we don't recall a better state, if we don't reach up and grab that rope, then we should be dragged down. If it were any other way, it would be wrong. If it were any other way, this wouldn't work. If it were any other way, there would be no possibility for us to ever get to something whole, something real, oneness. It's our choice. Internally, we have the power of choice. If you're in a bad state, you right now in the bad state even have the power of choice. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to give total consent to it. You don't have to go completely with it. You can say, this will pass. This is not I. I've been swamped by something. I did give consent to it. I find myself here in this stinking, dark, smelly place, but I don't want to be here. 
even though there's nothing that I can do to get out of it, I am not going to believe that it will be this way forever. I'm not going to give my consent to it. I will not continue to believe what the thoughts and the feelings are telling me. Already you can see that you've separated. You're saying the thoughts and the feelings, not my thoughts and my feelings. Already you've separated. Already you've begun to become a little more free. This is what I mean by recalling a better state, recalling the truth. We can think one way or another. When we can do nothing, we cannot believe or not give complete consent to the invaders. You can't do anything about it. If you're in it and you can't, I mean, I've seen you in it. I have been in it. Where there's nothing I can do about it. It's just like, I was in it and I was helpless. I could not pull myself out. Then don't give complete consent to it. Don't believe in it totally. Don't give any more power to the invaders that have already taken you captive. That's the beginning. That's what we can do. Be patient with yourself when you realize that you're all wrong, but you don't know how to get out. Just be patient with yourself. Bring the puppy back. Lighten up. This will pass. This will not last forever. If you will separate from it, if you will look at it and say, wait a second, this isn't me. I'm stuck in this. I've fallen into this pit. I may not be able to climb out right now, but if I wait here, help will come. If I will wait here quietly, if I will not thrash around and try and do all this other stuff and not give up, help will come. Yeah, it's a good feeling, isn't it? After a time, you get into a better state if you don't give consent and to believe everything that you're being told and everything you feel. That's the trick, man. Don't believe everything you're told. Don't believe every thought you have. Don't believe every feeling you have and say I to it. Don't own everything that comes into your head or into your sphere of emotions or in your sphere of thinking. When we realize beyond the shadow of a doubt that we have different eyes in us and yet we remain separate from them, then we begin to understand this work on a practical side. That's the practical side of this. The intellectual side, the doctrinal side, we've talked about. The practical side is when you actually can begin to realize beyond any doubt that you are not one, that you are many, that you are just filled with hundreds of thousands of different eyes, like little people with their own will, with their own wants, with their own thoughts, with their own feelings, with their own desires, with their own agendas. And you can remain separate from them. You can back away and look at them. Then you've begun to get what the practical side of this work is about. You've had glimpses of it. You've had moments where you could. It's a beginning. It's where we start. Take heart.